Um, it's really been a humbling experience uh, bringing together this uh, report. I did it because I was struck about two very obvious features of uh, the crisis that we've all been uh, enduring, which is that although it's a national crisis, it is a particularly acute crisis for older people and especially the most vulnerable older people, including uh, people in care homes. So it felt as if that was the, the spear tip of the, of the crisis, but also that there had been a great national recognition simultaneously about how much of the answer to that crisis lay in creativity and artistic practice. Uh, and it was clear to us the creative arts organizations and practitioners were keenly aware of this and wanted more than anything else to make a, a contribution in, in a time of extreme need. Um, it's a very simple report in terms of methodology. We uh, did a, a small survey, it's only 62 uh, replies, but they were really, really valuable and interesting and a lot of uh, the um, survey replies also had a very rich data which we included in the report. I've already said that had a large number of conversations with very expert colleagues um, around the um, report. And then the center of the report, as you're going to hear later on, uh, gives again further depth of that through case studies. And it's very much a celebration of that work. Um, I felt there was a need to document something that was really significant during the crisis and perhaps not getting always the attention that it deserved. The decision to call it key workers I sweated over because um, it's a big claim. But when I was thinking about um, the contribution of creative arts practitioners um, uh, through the pandemic, it felt a natural uh, claim to make that this work has over and over and over again been a lifeline for very vulnerable people in the same way as other uh, key workers during the pandemic, whether that's uh, someone bringing bread to your door or if it's at which actually could be an artist in some cases, in some of these um, instances, or a care worker. The report you'll see is actually largely from the perspective of artists. That's where most of the material has been gathered. Wherever possible, we've also included accounts and witness of uh, older people who are absolutely the point of everything that everyone uh, is doing but that's the main way in which material was gathered and as it's a report largely from the point of view of artists I don't want anyone to be under any illusion that we don't appreciate what a tremendously difficult time care workers whether it's paid care workers uh, in care homes or uh, people looking after family in their homes have had and how challenging it's been for uh, care workers to facilitate uh, creative activity. But many of them have said that it's been also the thing that's got them through uh, some dark days. So before we go on to um, uh, first person accounts of, of how it really felt to do this uh, work, I just wanted to add a few reflections looking back at uh, the case studies and the uh, survey material. The first thing is that creative aging came to the pandemic from a place of strength, in my view. Uh, that it wasn't accidental that we had such a skilled group of people with uh, good practice resources and thoughtfulness and very importantly, uh, connections and networks. 
And that really goes back to the strength of participatory arts uh, in this country uh, throughout the UK as a practice, uh, but also the rapid expansion of creative ageing uh, in the last 10 years and more. It's been, and I don't think we're going to know the results of this yet, but a strange um, development that one of the things that we've noticed over the last 10 years is how uh, creative aging has broadened. That um, looking 10 years back, you'd talk about um, fantastic organizations like Leeds Playhouse, but that was actually a rarity uh, of a large mainstream organization uh, with a specific offer for older people, people living with dementia, people uh, in care homes. That's changed uh, by the end of the last decade. We saw an enormous breadth of uh, work from what you might, for the want of a better phrase, call mainstream uh, arts organisations. Now, in a, in a bitter irony, um, they are often the organisations that are now most at risk, even with the emergency funding uh, that's come forward very valuably from the uh, the arts councils. So we really have to be very supportive and keep a keen eye that those organisations that are suddenly vulnerable in a way that they weren't are able to continue that work that they've uh, developed in such a welcome way over the last few years. Um, you will hear more about this, of course, but I think we shouldn't underestimate what a challenge it was to creative arts practitioners they themselves were living through very difficult times, uh, possibly with uh, uh, concerns about their own health, certainly concerns about the health of uh, others, having to grapple with uh, digital technology, my favorite subject, uh, in a new uh, way. Um, so I prove myself on an almost daily basis how bad I am at that. But actually, seriously, uh, artists often found that very challenging and stressful to develop those new techniques and to, and to refine those very rapidly. Um, I don't want, although I'm full of admiration for what's been done by um, the creative aging uh, practitioners over the last six months, I don't think we should dismiss that there's also loss and challenge and problems um, repeatedly people have talked about the difficulty of digital uh, divide. I suspect it's interesting in our case studies here that's possibly been less the case, for instance, for the work that's been done in Scotland that we'll hear about, but it's absolutely been the case for a, a number of the case uh, uh, studies. Um, without doubt, um, just about any artist would say they long to be able to go back to in-person uh, activity and the importance, for instance, uh, particularly with people living with dementia of touch that's, that's now absence and how challenging digital techniques can be, for instance, with people with living with uh, dementia. But it certainly feels as we look out into the future with huge difficulty and things changing on an almost daily basis, that the future, at least for a while, is blended. And by blended, I mean that actually um, arts organisations didn't suddenly just go digital. Virtually all the arts organisations that we talked to offered a blended response of in-person activities as well as new digital activities, which they previously hadn't been doing. And also that this can be challenging, that it can be quite difficult to introduce those participatory uh, approaches that have been so honed when someone's in the room with you. It sometimes feels easier to have a sense of, uh, of co-production. And um, it would, uh, though perhaps this isn't the most cheerful note to finish uh, uh, a, a talk on, it would also um, be um, very Pollyannaish not to acknowledge the tremendous worries regarding funding 
in the future for the arts organisations that we're concerned with, which is why I think it's very important to acknowledge what uh, and pay tribute to what a marvellous job that they've been doing over the last six months and how important this work is going to be in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, David. Um, I think we're going to move into our presentations. And uh, the first person I'd like to welcome uh, to, to speak to us is Kelly Barr, the creative, the arts and creatively, uh, the arts and creativity program manager from Age Cymru. So Age Cymru for a long time have been running artists in residence uh, programs in care homes across Wales. And through the pandemic, they continued to support creative activity in care homes. And Kelly is going to talk about the work that they did to continue to support residents, staff, and the artists that they work with. Kelly, can I welcome you? Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicky. That's a nice introduction. Um, if you think my job title is a mouthful in English, it's even harder in Welsh. <laughs> uh, so my name's Kelly. I am a white female and I've got uh, shoulder length red hair and I'm wearing glasses and I'm sat in a not particularly well lit room with some guitars in the background. Um, so yeah, as uh, Vicky said, I'm from Age Cymru. We're the largest um, charity working with and for older people in Wales. So um, our role covers a myriad of different um, sorts of work, but my role is looking at arts and creativity. Part of that is managing the Cartrevi programme, which as Vicky said, is our um, arts and resident arts and care homes programme. It's been running since uh, 2015. Um, we had shifted our approach um, with Cartrevi um, at the end of last year to look at staff and artists development, um, to look at the sustainability of the programme. So we were in a slightly fortunate position um, when COVID kind of arose because we didn't have, we weren't working directly with participants. We were working with staff to enable them to work with participants and work with artists to upskill them to do that as well. Um, but obviously we got a really strong sense very early on in March that the work that we were doing wasn't gonna be able to happen in care homes. So we, we shut that down quite quickly. And then we really thought about what we could do to support care homes through the immediate impact of, of COVID. And we're just very aware that um, care homes were under obviously an immense amount of pressure. And, um, but also there were care homes that maybe weren't as effective, but needed some creative, they needed the creativity, they needed some activities to support their residents. Um, and we also started getting, as we have done for quite a while, um, approached by different organizations across Wales who want to work in care homes um, because that we're really well recognised now thanks to um, the Arts Council of Wales for championing us and, and Bearing Foundation for championing us. So we are the kind of the go-to people when it comes to working in care homes, which is a wonderful place to be. But what we didn't want was lots and lots of organisations banging on the door for all the different care homes and going, we've got this thing, we've got this thing because we felt that they had enough to deal with. Um, so what we did was pull together a newsletter that we sent out every two weeks for several months. And that just pulled together our, our resources, um, some of the resources from the artists that we'd worked with, um, activities that they've developed, and also um, other organizations like BBC National Orchestra of Wales, who were really keen to do some performances in care homes. We were able to kind of liaise with them and set that up and then promote it through our networks then to care homes. So they were getting one email with all this different information in it. Now that we've um, kind of settled a little bit more and we know, well, we know what we know. Uh, we know that we can't go into care homes at the moment and we know that the best thing for us to do is to look at delivering our programme digitally. And I think for a lot of care home workers, that's probably a positive. They're not having to travel halfway across Wales to try and come to a workshop um, and with the rural nature of Wales it can be very difficult getting people to and from different places um, so delivering it online is potentially more accessible for them and we're, we're hoping to see a better turnout at that over the next few months and the same with our artists workshops as well where we, I think we will get a better retention because for artists it's so much easier to just be able to click on um, onto a workshop but for the artists delivering the workshops I think it is particularly difficult because they just 
you don't have that immediate feedback. Everyone's muted, everyone's getting on and doing their own thing. And the artists who are delivering are just looking at a whole screen of blank faces, which I think is going to be the challenge to kind of get through over, over the course of that. Um, I'll quickly mention as well, we run a festival called Gwamlin Festival that we've been running um, for, since 2006. And that celebrates creative aging across Wales throughout the month of May. Um, and obviously we were in a position where we just had to, to stop that almost immediately as, as soon as lockdown happened in March. And we've become really flexible with all of our um, event organizers. There's about 40 that we work with this year. And we're aware that some would need to um, deliver something in this financial year because they had commitments or they'd um, committed to working with particular freelancers. So some have delivered some activity in October, which we tagged around um, the age positive week that we run each year. Um, and the rest are now moving into May. Um, but we, we're having to think on our feet with that and be really, really flexible. But I would say all of the event organisers that I'm working with are very aware of digital exclusion. They are looking at different approaches, blended approaches, um, to make sure that they are reaching people that need it most. And I think now more than ever, it really feels like the participatory art sector is more aware than ever before about people that were maybe housebound prior to COVID, um, people that have been excluded for a very long time. Um, I think we as an organisation are much more aware of, of people that maybe need our services the most. So it's been an opportunity to really rethink what we're doing, make sure that we're, we're getting to people that need us the most and giving those people a voice as well, because they've all been lumped into one vulnerable um, kind of cohort with COVID. And we think now more than ever, it's really important to make sure that we're distinguishing that people are individuals and give them an opportunity to have their voices heard. So I'm aware that I may have spoken too quickly for Karen on the closed caption, so I'm very sorry. <laughs> I did promise I wasn't going to do that. Um, but yeah, that's a whistle stop tour of, of what we've been doing over the last few months. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining us, Kelly, and thank you for sharing that. That's that's brilliant. Um, I'd uh, love it if people out there in the audience listening were, were thinking about any questions that they'd uh, or comments that they'd want to bring to the discussion at the end. And please uh, feel free to use the Q&A feature to start adding them in. Um, so we're going to move on from Kelly and we're going to uh, jump from Wales to Leeds um, and I'd like to introduce Nikki Taylor. Um, Nikki is the Theatre and Dementia Research Associate from Leeds Playhouse and Leeds Playhouse have been involved in the creative ageing sector since the 90s. And since 2010, they've been developing a body of pioneering work uh, around creative aging programs for people living with dementia. Nikki will share a little bit about how they shifted to a blended program of digital and analog outreach. Um, and in addition to that, the practical support they provided for their participants. And Nikki will be joined by Jo Lee, a participant from the program who will share some of her experiences with us. Nikki, can I welcome you in? Thanks very much, Vicky. Thanks for the welcome. Um, so just to audio describe myself, I'm a white woman with long blonde hair and glasses, and I'm wearing a yellow cardigan. Um, it's brilliant to be part of this conversation. Um, a typical week at Leeds Playhouse would mean hundreds of older people engaging in creative activity with us in person. Um, our Heydays programme for over 55s has been running for 30 years. Um, our Our Time programme for people living with dementia and their supporters is a really integral part of what we do. Um, all of these projects encourage a sense of purpose, social connection. Um, it's about exploring creativity and opening up communication. So it was extremely troubling to us to have to stop this activity so abruptly in March. Um, we're aware that it has a great impact on people's well-being and that the people we work with are already isolated and COVID made it even more so. Um, it was very clear from early on that COVID was going to present a disproportionate impact on older people and also that ageism played a part in some of the messaging around COVID from the very early stages. 
Coupled with that, um, the arts sector was particularly hard hit. Um, by our nature, we gather people, we are gatherers, um, and our workforce is vulnerable, mainly freelance, um, but also incredibly creative, incredibly resilient, very innovative, and extremely well placed to help. So we began a process of checking in with all our participants, and there are hundreds of them. So that was hundreds of welfare calls to check initially that people had food, medication, contact with services that they needed. If not, then we were able to refer to some of our incredible third sector partners across Leeds or a very linked and connected city. Um, and once we'd established that, that people were safe and provided for, we could start to nurture them creatively. So as Vicky said, we, we had um, a blended programme which involved initially sending packs out through the post with creative activities to engage people um, in a way that made up for them missing out in person. We created newsletters for people um, by email and also through the post. And we set up a tremendous team of um, telephone volunteers to make sure that our participants had at least a conversation with a person once a week. Whilst that was happening, we were also researching and entering the world of digital ourselves. So getting to know um, the, the capabilities of Zoom, the pitfalls of Zoom, um, and how we could encourage people to take a risk on using that technology with us. Um, it was immediately apparent that there were great inequities in, in digital access. So that was about people having the right devices, people having access to Wi-Fi or data, um, and also people's access to confidence to use these things. So um, it was very clear we had to work in a very personalized way with people and that it was going to take delicate, um, supportive um, and nurturing approaches to help people gain confidence. So we started a program of coaching with using the tech with whatever people had and that was focused on people gaining confidence with each tiny little step so these tiny connections that we could make maybe somebody could telephone into a zoom call so they could at least hear a number of voices that they would they would usually hear in person um Potentially people just having access to seeing another human face in a Zoom meeting was enough in those early stages where people were feeling extremely frightened and extremely lonely and vulnerable. Um, we have some amazing partners who have helped us with accessing equipment for people to use. So we've had loans of tablets and iPads. We've had donations. People have offered to buy technology to connect um, people with dementia. And that means we've been able to transfer our activity online. So we have managed to get people connected. Um, one of the first things we did was um, hold a virtual press night for a show called Maggie May that we had spent three years developing with a writer, Francis Poet, with great uh, input and co-production from people living with dementia. And this was going to tell the story of living positively and living creatively with dementia. And um, sadly, we were only able to offer three performances before government advice um, to avoid theatres was issued. Um, for some people who were involved in that process, if we were to um, produce that show again in a year's time or two years time, they may well have lost their connection to their contribution to the show. So that so having something timely to note that, yes, we did this, you were involved, you made a difference to this show was really important. So holding a celebration felt um, really vital. We've been able to transfer our activity for people living with dementia online. So we now offer our time sessions via Zoom. Um, and that's all about creativity. It's about moving and singing and exploring and imagining together. We also run a group called DEEP, which is Dementia Engagement and Empowerment Project. And that um, is very much about people living with dementia having influence and has felt particularly important um, because it places the voice of a person with lived experience as the defining factor of the messages that we put out. And it felt really important to hear from people living with dementia during this pandemic. We've also moved Hey Days online. So our um, 
older people taking part in heydays can come along and have that social and creative experience they would normally have in person. I wanted to just highlight um, a couple of challenges and a couple of positives that have come out of this. Um, so the challenges in terms of working with people living with dementia, there is no substitute for working in person. As, as David said, those little, um, those little squeezes of the hand, a little nudge and a wink directed specifically to one person is very encouraging in a subtle way that doesn't expose people. It doesn't highlight um, people losing their way. It's a, it's a very subtle form of encouragement that feels pretty impossible to, to do on Zoom because the big yellow square tends to highlight any, um, any miscommunications rather than making them fade into the background. So we do long to get back together with people. Um, we also noticed that for some care partners who are less familiar with technology, facilitating their partner's involvement in the session can be a big ask when they're already dealing with the challenges of the, the video call themselves. So the screen can be a barrier. And it means that we recognise that for some people, a one to one session would be much more appropriate. And we are putting steps in place to try and realise that before too long. In terms of the positives, people are in their own spaces. You know, this is an intimate time. We're seeing into each other's worlds and people are able to use parts of those worlds to support them. So people do feel more comfortable. There might be less social embarrassment. There's an opportunity to kind of take a step back mid session if people need to without, um, if that was in person at the theatre, that would involve someone standing up and leaving a room. If it's just taking a step back and staying quiet for a while on a Zoom screen, then that's a much easier way for people to have control over their own involvement in the session. Um, just looking to the future, um, we are kind of cautiously hopeful. We have concerns. We feel a great sense of responsibility about reintroducing in-person sessions. We talk about it a lot and we think about how we're going to manage this. We know we can pe keep people really safe at the Playhouse. We've had amazing feedback from audiences who came back during the last period of time that they were allowed to attend performances. Um, but we know that if we ask people to come into the city centre, they have to negotiate public transport and that opens up a whole different um, consideration for people. But we are hopeful that offering a digital strand of work might in future help people to connect for longer with us. So people who may opt out of um, sessions may have an opportunity to be involved for longer. So that's just a little bit of reflection on my experience. Um, but I do think it's really important to hear from somebody who's been taking part in sessions and really brightening them up for us. So if you've seen the report that we're talking about today, you'll have seen some beautiful photos of Pauline who takes part in her sessions alongside her brilliant, creative, wonderful, supportive daughter, Jo. <laughs> um, and Jo is here just to tell us a little bit more about what it feels like to attend those sessions online with us at the Playhouse. Over to you, Jo. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Jo and I'm a white uh, middle-aged woman and right now I have some very fluffy big green, blue and white pom-poms on my head and this is something that I, makes me feel happy and also my mum. So yeah, I mean, before I'm currently a full-time living carer uh, and have been looking after both parents, both with Alzheimer's for the last three years, um, now just down to my mum and my mum and I... Um, Pre being a carer, I was a full time uh, artist and also uh, an art teacher. And I really know and appreciate uh, the value and benefits of creative engagement. And this is something that Playhouse do brilliantly. Um, so my mum and I have been along to the um, our time sessions and it was just a uh, a real highlight of the week for mum. We were dressing up, we were going out, we were going to a place that was familiar. This is before the lockdown. And having had that time to get to know the, the uh, people at the Playhouse with Nikki and the team who've done an amazing job, it then came to lockdown and we were gutted. We thought, oh heck, what's gonna happen now? It was such a, a connection every week and we all formed such good bonds. Um, 
and it has had its, as, as Nikki said, it has its trials and, and errors, um, getting mum used to being on a Zoom. And sometimes that can be a bit overwhelming when you've got all the little squares there. But uh, on the whole, it's been a fantastic uh, resource for us. Uh, stuck at home, we can't go out. And there on the screen every week, every other week, are a bunch of people that are very um, supportive, it's a lovely friendly network we're singing together we're having giggles together and i think like nikki said you, your barriers are down a bit more maybe in a way you're at home you um yes if i suddenly need to dash mum to the loo or something like that i can do that we can go for a quick drink and i'm lucky that i am caring with my mum and i know not every body who joins the our time sessions have a, a carer with them um and I might have to go in a minute actually because I can hear mum so <laughs> but I just want to say um yeah they have been invaluable um the zoom the power of zoom has been brilliant for I think a lot of people in this hard time of loneliness and it it, it helps us all reach out and realize we're not alone and the creative engagement side is a really positive uplifting benefit to all of us thank you okay Thank you so much, Nikki and Joe, for really bringing a flavour of, of what you've been doing into the room. I think we all we all felt that as much as we took in the brilliant information that you were sharing with us. Um, we're going to hop from Leeds now and go all the way up to Scotland. And I want to introduce Amy Watt uh, from Eden Court Theatre and Chris Wilson, who's a freelance artist. With um, both. Uh, both um, Amy and Chris have been working with the National Theatre of Scotland on um, an Elders Social Dance Club, which began in May 2019. And it's really a celebratory project that was supposed to culminate in a coming out ball in June 2022. And that's been moved to 2021. Um, Amy and uh, Chris are here and they're going to share a little bit with us about transitioning from that live to digital delivery and I think Amy you're going to speak first. Yes I am, thanks Becky. Um, hi folks, I'm Amy, I'm a white cis woman with long brown hair just past my shoulders. Today I'm wearing uh, my cosy green woolen jumper. Uh, so I am the engagement producer for Theatre at Eden Court which is an art centre in Inverness in the Highlands of Scotland. Eden Court are a partner on the LGBTI Elder Social Dance Club project. So as part of my role at Eden Court, I am one of the creative practitioners on the LGBTI plus Elder Social Dance Club. So I'm gonna talk a bit about how Dance Club worked pre-COVID and then Chris will talk about how we've pivoted since March. So the LGBTI plus Elder Social Dance Club is a space for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and gender diverse and intersex oh, slow down. Oh, slow down, please. Karen. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'll start that back. The LGBTI plus Elders Social Dance Club is a space for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and gender diverse and intersex elders along with their allies to come together once a month for a chat, a dance and a pretty good laugh. Although Dance Club focuses on the elders, everyone is welcome. You're not asked for proof of age or ID as you come through the door. The LGBTI plus Elders Social Dance Club was started in Melbourne, Australia by the arts company All the Queen's Men in 2016. It was born out of research that found that LGBTI plus elders were going back into the closet, meaning they were hiding their sexuality and or gender identity when they started interacting with elder health and care settings. Similar anecdotal evidence has also been documented in Scotland. So Dance Club was created in response to this research. So Dance Club is about celebrating this diverse community of people who often face a double whammy of invisibility because of their age and their sexuality and or their gender identity. That doesn't mean that all members of Dance Club live an out life, but the project is there to amplify those members of the community 
who have lived through social and judicial prejudice and have paved the way for greater freedoms for LGBTI people now. So regular monthly dance clubs have taken place in Inverness and Glasgow since May 2019. And there have also been pop-ups in Wick, Ayr, Edinburgh and Perth, to name a few. So what would you expect at a dance club? The space is set up in a cabaret style, helping to facilitate mingling and chatting. We always make sure that someone has someone to chat to. It'll be no surprise to hear that there is dancing at Dance Club, a mix of lead dancing and freestyle. Dancing is completely optional, with some members preferring to have a good chat during the dancing section. Like lots of great events, there is a wonderful hospitality table full of tea, coffee, bubbly and non-alcoholic bubbly to give it that celebratory feel. We love a scone and there might even be a cheese board and some pink lady apples if you're lucky. So each session is opened with a toast, giving voice to an elder to share some thoughts and contemplations with us. Some months we add in a different activity, uh, an LGBTI plus quiz, uh, or bingo possibly, uh, mapping of significant LGBTI plus places locally and nationally, any sort of activity that will facilitate discussion and provide opportunities to share stories. Ultimately, the space is about creating community and socialising together. So in March, we had to have quite a big rethink about how we were going to continue to host Dance Club. So I'll hand over to Chris, who will now talk about how we have done that. Thank you, Amy. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Chris. I am a cis white male with a beard and long wavy brown hair sitting on a chair in front of a gold slash curtain and a guitar, but I won't be playing the guitar. Um, and I am one of the, the creative facilitators on this project. While Amy was running the group in Inverness, I was part of the team simultaneously running the group in Glasgow. When the pandemic hit and isolation felt overwhelming, we found a way to not only help each of these communities, but also bring them together in a way we had never anticipated. By moving into the digital realm and realizing that geography and physical distance become redundant online. We created a safe and secure digital model on Zoom that would aim to be as welcoming, as inclusive, and of course, as fun as our in-person events, we quickly realized that a digital event needs to have more structure because being online doesn't, for example, allow for the natural flow of conversations between separate groups. So as a team, we reworked our creative practices quite significantly to create a more performative and theatrical approach to the engagement. Suddenly our homes were transformed into virtual theater spaces complete with green screens, disco balls, or gold slash curtains. <laughs> we held on to some elements from our pre-COVID sessions, including the opening toast. And of course, we kept the dancing going by offering themed follow-along dance routines, complete with costumes and props for our members to do safely at home, always offering freestyle options for those who just enjoy dancing in their own way, and always recognizing that some members just enjoy watching. Interspersed throughout the dancing, we added a new element, our members' very own desert island discos, where our elders would have the opportunity to select a music track to be played, tell us why they chose it, and allow us to dance along to it, ultimately offering us a wonderful insight into their lives. Once the social dance club session was finished for another month, we would find other ways to add more digital social opportunities. And currently we have a very popular cookery class and an origami making class led by our community members. So what is the impact of this new model and where do we go from here? Well, the short answer is that on the whole, the digital model has been a huge success. We have strengthened the community. We have increased the community. So far, we have welcomed participants from all over the UK, Canada, Europe, and Australia. But we are also aware that there are some people we are still not able to reach, mainly due to people's access to digital technology 
and also, as Nikki mentioned earlier, their confidence with it. We continue to look for ways to overcome these problems, and, and some of these efforts have included postcard exchanges, contributions to a mail-out activity pack created by Luminate, which is Scotland's creative aging organization. And we also have been offering technical support, guidance, and equipment for those who are new to a digital platform. A huge advantage of the pandemic was that we were able to extend the project for a whole year, allowing us to build the community more and allowing us to develop a longer term strategy and legacy model that would let the project continue without the fully funded support of the National Theatre of Scotland. Currently, the project is due to culminate with the coming back out ball in for, for, for next year in 2021. Um, in the meantime, we will continue with our popular digital dance clubs until such a time that we are able to meet again in person. One thing that COVID has taught us is that we are able to rapidly adapt and persevere in an ever-changing environment. And so by continuing to seek out new ways to stay connected, by listening to the needs of our elders and each other, we move forward fully armed with positivity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris and Amy. That sounds like something that I would totally want to do. It sounds so much fun. Um, I just wanted to let everybody in the webinar know that if you haven't had a chance to download a copy of Key Workers, it is available on the Bering Foundation website and we'll make sure that there's a link in, in the chat for you. Um, but we have some time now for some Q&A and for some discussion. And there are a few questions that are popping up in our Q&A section. Um, but before we, we go to them, I just wanted to start with a, a general question for anyone um, on the panel. Um, it would be really great to, to hear from each of you. And I think you've all mentioned this uh, to some degree in your presentation, but maybe digging into it a little bit deeper about what's been the, the biggest loss and the biggest gain for you as artists and organizations of working with older people during this period. Amy. Um, yeah, so I think the biggest loss, I think like everyone said, is, is being in the space and Therefore, in the digital digital realm, we are we don't have the same connection with some members um, that we would have on such a regular basis when they were in the space. Um, the possibly uh, some people as well just don't um, want to really connect on Zoom. Um, so having phone calls with them uh, and things like that is great, but it, they're not sharing in the in the regular session. So I do think that's that's the biggest loss, but but the, and the biggest gain, as Chris said, for us anyway, is that we um, have have really increased the community and you know crossing borders as well has been it's such a huge plus um, and time zones <laughs> crossing time zones um, it has really opened up the community so much more, which I don't think is something that we ever would have thought would have happened at the start of this project really. Thank you, Amy. Would anyone else like to join in on that? Nikki? Um, I think in terms of losses, the, you know, this is a time of loss and people are experiencing really um, deeply troubling things in their lives and in their communities. And, and I think that the, the possibilities to share that and, and support each other through it is one of the great losses of this we are we're negotiating really you know tricky waters and and we these are the times we need to come together so to not be able to do that to not be able to mark the the loss of life the the loss of independence um for some people with dementia the the loss of functionality that you know this is this is a real um a real problem when we can't meet to do that um in terms of gain um i would agree that you know we're reaching people that maybe we didn't reach before or um you know being able to connect with people further away is really exciting you know i've seen in the in the chat there's someone from north yorkshire who'd like to connect that's brilliant you know that's 
that's wonderful and we wouldn't maybe have been able to do that in person so these are the opportunities that we need to really hold on to thank you um there were lots of uh, kind of more practical questions in the the q a about um that transition to digital um and one in particular was around the amount of preparation and information that was given to the participants regarding the the, the shift in the way that you were delivering sessions and um would any of you be willing to just talk a little bit more about how you prepared yourself and the people that you were working with to to make that transition <laughs> Nikki I don't want to dominate so please jump in if anyone else would like to join um I felt like I had to educate myself to a, a as considerable degree with using zoom because I felt a, a sense of personal responsibility for people's online safety um because people needed to trust that we were in a, a good place to support them we create safe spaces all the time in person and online it's even more important to do that so I read every possible um, blog about Zoom or the guidance. There were some amazing guides that different organizations had put together, um, which helped me to create a guide for my participants so that um, they had step-by-step -step, um, introductions to the different facets of Zoom and the things that they needed to consider as well so that you know they would understand that they were opening up an element of their personal homes to um, to people and they needed to consider that so it was all you know it's very detailed and very time consuming um and then just recognizing that everybody needed a personal approach in how to address that um so for some people now we're prompting by a telephone call or a text um people need different things some people need the zoom link as it is in you know where you click on it and it gets you straight into zoom other people need the figures so that it gets remembered in their zoom list of, of meetings that they're attending and it's just keeping on top of what people need and and which different approach to take so yeah a level of organization is useful in that as well okay kelly I wanted to say that from our perspective of, of delivering um, online workshops with staff members and artists, um, we realised quite early on that we would normally be delivering, um, you know, in a very practical way, especially around visual arts with lots of materials. So we had to kind of think about sending out kit lists in advance to, to care staff and to artists of what, what would be needed. Um, and then where it wasn't possible for care homes to get that stuff in advance, we were able to support them getting some of that work. Um, and I think the role of, of, of our coordinator in those sessions has become really important because the artists are trying to deliver the workshop. And like I said, sometimes often facing, you know, muted calls or, you know, a, a wall of silence. Um, so she does a lot of kind of... Um, encouraging conversation and laughter and joking that would normally happen in the room so her role has become even more important than normal because she's battling against the the wall of silence so um that's that's what we've had to consider from Cartrevi's perspective thank you for sharing that um and Kelly, just kind of uh, picking up from that there, there was another question actually that's probably particularly for you about what you found most helpful in supporting care homes and care workers with creative uh, with this creative activity at this at this time i think it's um we've been very lucky that we've you know through age company we do a lot of work with care homes so not just the car project but we run um, an improvement program for managers as well so i've been able to work with my colleague um really directly to talk to talk to her about getting direct feedback from managers about what they feel like they need at the moment and very much listening to them and reacting to what to their needs because i think what at the moment they and has been in the past you know they are they're tarred with a particular brush and they're you know in, especially in the media there's a lot of negativity so i think just an, an opportunity for them to talk about what they need is is really important um and in terms of the new, newsletters that was us reacting to our own experience of, of trying to get in touch with care homes because we know that you know we've often we've posted things we've 
emailed things, we've called people and, you know, things get put on a desk or put in the bin or put in a drawer or emails get deleted. So we know how difficult it is to communicate with care homes when they're particularly busy. So that was that was just a reflection of our own experience and wanting to make sure that we made it as easy as possible for care homes. Um, and in turn, we made sure that when we were speaking to organisations, you know, arts organisations that were really keen to work with care homes, which is a wonderful thing and we want to encourage it, but we want them to be really realistic about what can be done, um, especially right now. So we were having really honest conversations with BBC National Orchestra of Wales about um, the technological difficulties they might face, um, you know, whether, you know, because not all care homes have a laptop or a you know, and now a lot of our care homes do have devices because we've had some support from Digital Communities Wales, but a lot of them didn't have any devices. You know, the care home manager had a laptop, you know, and you might have a TV, but it might not be connected to the internet. So we were able, we were trying to just get people's expectations where they needed to be so that it, it was, wasn't was putting any extra pressure on care homes and care home staff. It was all about enhancing experiences for the residents and for the staff without adding extra work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Chris and Amy, I had a, a question come up for you as well um, about basically your your project was so much about a, a live experience and the challenges you had transferring that kind of live exciting moment by moment experience into a, a digital platform. Would you mind talking about that a little bit? and sharing your reflections on it. Yeah, of course. I wonder if we'll, we'll, we'll maybe do, both of us can answer Chris. Sure. Um, yeah, so it, it was a, it's a learning process and it still is, I think, for us. It's a monthly event that happens. So even now, seven, eight, eight times in, we're not sure how many, you know, a, after a session, we have to reflect on it and and then look at what's going to happen next, as well as, um, you know, with the resources at, at the National Theatre of Scotland, with their tech team as well, um, and the producers who are really up on all of the, the, the updates that are happening so often on <laughs> platforms as well, um, and how we can integrate those to, to make it a really um, live experience. Yeah, and which Chris has been... Uh, an absolute expert at creating the live experiences on Zoom as well, Chris. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, at first we thought it might be quite an easy transition, but obviously <laughs> it definitely took a bit of, you know, some teething problems. Um, and as I touched on in the, um, in, in my part of the presentation, it's, it's, it, it develops a slightly more performative edge. It's not, unlike being in a, in person doing a social dance club where we're kind of just you know testing the water feeling the mood of the room you kind of have to have everything almost timed within to the minute on these digital um, present platforms just because it, it does almost end up running like a show um, but it's interesting once you start it once you start getting into that world it feels as much as we love being in person, we're definitely gaining something from the, the Zoom experience as well. And it, it does beg the question, you know, once things do go back to normal, do we continue doing something digitally? Because we are reaching, obviously, people that we wouldn't be reaching um, if we were doing it in real life. And that's not even just in terms of geography. There's people who more, are more comfortable just being at home and not being with these with with other people so they're still being you know they're still socializing but they're from the from the comfort of their own home so there's lots of lo lots of things that we've learned in that respect as well um and another huge thing is that as a team i feel that we've kind of been able to um combine all our skill sets in a in a, in a way which we hadn't really done until <laughs> until until this had happened so yeah we're constantly learning I think that was um, that was a, a question that, that popped up in a, a, or seemed to be filtering through the conversation quite a lot um, 
I know that you spoke in your case study about reaching more people outside of the country, but also the sense of some of the original members not being able to join, um, and, but the opportunity to engage people who, who wouldn't be able to join physically or wouldn't be comfortable to join physically. I wonder if anyone else is reflecting on, um, I guess there's a two part question on ways in which they can continue to reach the people who are perhaps not so digitally savvy um what kind of strategies you're putting in place but also um whether this way of working is something that you're thinking about continuing in any way beyond this current moment nikki um yeah the personally in terms of the work with people living with dementia i think um it's going to be with us for quite a long time that we're going to be focused on the online delivery um, but I was speaking to my colleague Maggie, who um, is responsible for Heydays, and she is looking at approaches that would fit in with the tier system if that were to be reintroduced, so that she's got a strategy for um, possibly looking at, because we understand that coming into the city centre is potentially the biggest risk for people and the biggest barrier, um, looking at um, postcode kind of um, analysis of where members are located and doing more um, targeted activity in localized areas rather than expecting everyone to come into the city centre. So that's a that's a potential for Heydays members to have something um, in their local communities, which would just give a little stepping stone to getting back to some kind of in-person activity. Kelly. Um, thank you. I've definitely been considering um, making use of telephone conversations um, in future projects, not so much in what we're currently delivering, but in what we might deliver in the future. Um, and, you know, it's not the same, but it, we have learned ways of, of, of engaging with people over the phone and encouraging conversations. And I'm particularly interested in storytelling um around around using the phone and things like that so that's something that i'm definitely looking at um and as well as looking at what we could possibly do outdoors um around some of the heritage sites that we've got in wales um but that's all very early days um in terms of um digitally i, I think i'd really like to continue to do some sector support work um i think that's become something that we've done um kind of naturally throughout COVID um, with the wider participatory arts sector and it's definitely unified us and given us a stronger voice together and I think I'd like to encourage that to continue in some way because the feedback from freelancers in particular has been that it's been really beneficial to share best practice, share learning or just have a moan <laughs> about what's going on um, and also just it all just feeds into any evidence that we need to give to Welsh Government BCMS about about our needs as a sector moving forward so those are things I'm considering. Thank you um, and I, I think that kind of connects with uh, another question that has come through uh, the chat which I'm going to paraphrase but um, in terms of the the messages that we would like to give to sector funders and policy makers about the value of the work that we're providing for older communities, do you think enough stories are coming through and bubbling up to the surface? And what messages would you like to share with funders and policy makers about what, uh, what, you know, particularly during this pandemic period that you would like to see change or improve? <laughs> um, I think David wanted to answer that question. Um, just to say for the first part of the uh, question, uh, Vicky, actually, I don't think there's been enough attention to the role of uh, creative uh, ageing during the uh, pandemic. I think it's been this brilliant mass movement that hasn't actually got the attention um, uh, that it deserves. And even though the funders that I know um, through the Arts Councils, for instance, are deeply sympathetic and really do believe in what you're doing, they are also facing, as we always say, absolutely unprecedented pressures uh, on their funding. Um, so I don't think there's any 
lack of understanding. But as I say in the report, I do think you need to blow your own trumpet. Thanks. Thank you. I think, Nikki, you were about to come in as well there. Yeah, I, I just wanted to highlight that we've had some really supportive conversations with funders who have totally understood the need to um, repurpose grants, to um, think about things in different ways, to look at different approaches. And, and we have been met with real generosity of spirit in terms of um, thinking about how to spend money differently to make the biggest impact. Um, I think there's been some interesting examples that have reached um, wider attention you know there's, there's there was the example a few months ago of um an activities coordinator in a care home um who made record sleeve art with residents um which got a lot of attention so you know there, there are some examples of uh, people really engaging with the messages around creativity um, but i agree we need to do much much more to um make the case because this is going to be a long-term project and we need long-term investment in this sort of work. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go through some of the other questions in, in the Q&A um, just to, to make sure that we, we include as many in, as we can in the time that we have. Um, there was a question from Matt from Cardboard Citizens, which was asking around um, any uh, collection or shared body of work that's being generated in this time that, um, that has been made by, um, or that is a creative re reflection on this time, either made by artists or participants at, from any of your programmes, are, are you holding uh, or are you gathering collections of the, the art that's been made at this time? Kelly. We're actually running a, a storytelling project at the moment and we've just launched the public side of it today. Um, so we um, got a tiny bit of funding from a small charitable foundation to have um, telephone conversations with five of the older people that we'd um, that had kind of referred themselves to us earlier on in March as being particularly at risk of isolation and loneliness. So we've been having conversations with them and we're working with an artist to pull together their life story narrative and about how it's impacted on their ability to cope during the lockdown. Um, and then what we're doing is a public call out asking for people to respond in a, through creative writing in, in terms of, again, how their, how, how their life experiences have helped them or hindered them in their, um, in their ability to, to kind of respond to the, the lockdown. Um, and what we hope to do is publish something either digitally or hard copy um, because we think it's really important to capture this this moment, particularly for older people um, and 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 the stories, the stories that we've heard so far have been absolutely incredible. People's lives are absolutely amazing and, and you get the impression that people don't get the opportunity to to talk through their entire life very often um, to someone who isn't family, you know, and I think that's particularly an interesting element of it. So yeah, we're really keen to do that. So um, we'll be doing that in Wales over the coming, coming, coming months. Thank you. Fantastic, Kelly. That's, that's really great. Um, we had another question for any key advice, tips or takeaways to social um, and healthcare practitioners who are new to engaging older people through digital or blended means. So have you got anything, any top tips that you can share with people who are thinking about taking on this work? Kelly. I won't dominate. Um, I just wanted to, to highlight that um, I've been finding um, the Twitter handle arts and care homes really really inspiring um they had a celebration day in september and it was just so wonderful to see so many amazing examples of, of creativity happening in care homes um as well as napa which is the david might correct me national association activity coordinators something i don't know what the p is um but they they're wonderful as well um, and they're def I just definitely say I've, I've got so much inspiration from them and hope that there's lots that can be done at a really difficult time. So I would I would always start there, stealing other people's ideas. 
I think Harriet can put that in the in the text. Yeah. I think there was a there was a gathering of kind of lots of resources that are that are easily downloadable and available. So that's definitely something to to check out if you are starting out. Chris, I thought you looked like you were going to jump in with some excellent suggestions and offers. No, I have to apologize. My screen keeps doing this freezy thing <laughs> and I actually lost. <laughs> I didn't hear about 30 seconds of what was said, so I actually didn't know what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about that. No, um, it was just a, a request for somebody who is um, new to, to providing creative activities, working in social and um, a social healthcare practitioner about any tips about um, engaging people creatively digitally or in blended means if you had any one learning that you're taking away from this moment about what to do or what not to do oh gosh i think if i was to think about it there's probably a whole list of do's and don'ts um i mean it is it is so tricky on the basis especially for and i and i relate to all the work that's going on in the care homes because actually i do that on it as an aside well i used to do that as before COVID as well. And I know that the, the, the importance of that physical interaction and, and I don't know, I, I just, yes, it must be so difficult for you to, 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 to be in this digital world without that crucial element to the work. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I mean, ooh, advice. Um, I think the, the, the I mean, really, the only thing that I can go by is that there's not one, there's not one solution, you've got to have a flexible approach to everything and your idea that you have at point A will most definitely be different at not even point Z, but point B. So it's just being able to constantly just relax and allow, allow, yeah, allow yourself to adapt to this environment, which is completely changing all the time. There are no rights or wrongs and everybody's doing it at the same time. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> it's not really answering the question. No, that's a great answer. Thank you, Chris. Um, Nikki. Um, I would advise that there are so many people who would want to work in partnership with you to help you realize what you're trying to do. And I think that there are there's a lot of goodwill and there's a lot of people who are now operating on platforms where they can maybe involve more people. So you might be able to segue into things that people are already doing. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential out there if you approach partners. Um, but another thing that I would say is don't be afraid to start really small because if you make a difference to one person, that is a really significant achievement at the moment and could make a fundamental difference to their well-being. So focus on one person and see what their individual need is and see what difference you can make for them. And, um, and then it just grows from there. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Nikki. I feel like that is a really brilliant response for us to kind of come to a, a close with. Um, before I finish, I'm going to, uh, this might be a mistake, I'm going to open up to David Cutler to see if you have any last words that you want to share <laughs> with the webinar. I wanted to say how wonderful the presentations were. Um, it really brings to life, I think, in a way that's very hard to do uh, on the page. Uh, and there's so much love and wisdom that goes into this work. So congratulations. Thank you. I, I will definitely echo that. Um, and as I said before, I think Harriet has placed in the chat a link to the, the full report. There are many other organisations who are continuing to do brilliant work um, in really, really challenging circumstances. And I think there's a lot of inspiration to be gained by the work that people are doing and probably a lot of learning that will be that we've captured in this moment we'll probably need to re review and reflect on in the future um i want to say a big thank you to all of our participants today for for joining us to to talk about the work that they've been doing and all of the uh participants in the the full report um i'd like to say thank you to david and harriet for pulling the report together and thank you to harriet for 
organizing this opportunity for us to, to have this kind of moment of sharing and inspiration. And thank you to all of our webinar participants for joining us today. Um, and I hope to connect with you all in real life at some point in the future. Thank you.